from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with digital coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. Special coverage sponsored by AWS Worldwide Public Sector. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage. This is theCUBE virtual and our coverage of AWS reInvent with special coverage of the Worldwide Public Sector Day. I'm your host, John Furrier. We are theCUBE and I'm joined by Trey Vance, hyperscaler partner lead with Red Hat. Trey, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, uh, great to be here, John. Uh, very happy to be at my first virtual uh, reInvent, but probably my third in a row uh, reInvent itself. You know, it's super exciting. Usually we're in person, as you mentioned, but the Cube virtual, your virtual, we got to do it virtual this year. But the game is still the same. It's about learning, it's about getting updates on what's relevant for customers with the pandemic. Um, a lot of things have been highlighted and this has been the big fun of reInvent because you, know, you mentioned three years, this is our eighth year. We've been there every year since the, uh, since the, except for the first year. But you just look at the growth, right? But it's still the same cadence of more news, more announcements, more higher level services. You know, with, with OpenShift, we've been following that with Kubernetes and the containers, service meshes. You're seeing microservices, all this coming together around open source and public sector is the main benefit of that right, right now. If you look at uh, most of the interviews that I've done, the mandate for change in public sector is multifold in every vertical, education to military, right? So, so there's a need to get off your butt and get going with cloud if you're in public sector. Um, tell us more about Red Hat and the AWS partnership around public sector, because I think that's really what we want to dig into. Absolutely, and there definitely have been uh, changes this year that have inspired uh, innovation. Uh, Red Hat and AWS have been on a path for innovation for quite a while. Uh, Red Hat in working with the open source community and taking an iterative approach to what we call upstream first, which is essentially uh, to develop uh, in the, the open source communities to mature those into enterprise grade products and then to iteratively take those findings back to the, the open source community. So uh, Red Hat and AWS have had a, a long history of collaboration uh, starting all the way back in 2007 with Red Hat Enterprise Linux being available uh, within the AWS console, uh, continuing on to things like uh, AWS Quick Starts, which are reference uh, architectures for how to deploy products that you're managing yourself. Uh, and then more recently, uh, recent being the last say four years uh, or to offer a OpenShift managed service within uh, AWS and now continuing that with a, a joint offering that's going to be forthcoming. That's the Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS, which will be uh, the, the first native offering and joint offering with uh, AWS by a, by a third party such as ourselves. So there's a, a history of innovation there and a history of collaboration. And I think we'll talk a little bit later on in the interview specifically about how that relates to public sector and their unique needs. Yeah, well, let's just get in there. What are the, some of the unique needs? Because there's value in your partnership with AWS. You laid out a bunch of those services. So certainly there's customers that are in, in need. What specific requirements are there? Can you tell us how Red Hat and AWS work together to meet these challenges? Sure. So. Uh, the public sector uh, group is composed of uh, many organizations and agencies, both uh, when I think of public sector, I think of uh, the federal civilian space. I think about the DOD, uh, the state and local and education. All of those elements of public sector have uh, different needs, uh, but there are some standards that are very pervasive in the public sector, uh, things like uh, FIPS, and how you articulate your compliance with particular um, validated cryptographical modules or with how you express uh, a control statement using something like the uh, NIST 853, which is critically important for cloud service offerings. And so those are some of the things that uh, Red Hat and AWS have a heritage of uh, working together uh, and also providing deep explanations uh, for those organizations and their mission so that they can comfortably move into the cloud, do digital transformation uh, by taking applications that may be on-prem today and having the confidence to move those into the cloud with 
security and compliance at the forefront. So uh, when, when I think about uh, the, the overall mission of, of government and then the threats to that mission, whether they be state actors, uh, you know, individuals, it, there are, are serious, uh, there are serious solutions that have been developed both in the open source community to provide greater visibility into uh, security. And there are things that the government has done to kind of create frameworks for uh, compliance. And those are things that we work with uh, in the open. So we have a, a process that we call compliance as code, which can be found uh, both uh, inside of repositories like GitHub, but also on our, our website where we articulate how our products actually work with those compliance frameworks uh, the cryptographical authorizations and, and some of the certifications for uh, technology that the government's put forward. So if it's compliance as code, like infrastructure as code, which is DevOps, what do you call it? Gov DevOps or GovOps, uh, compliant ops? <laughs> it's kind of got a little DevOps vibe there. I mean, this is a real, I mean, real question. I mean, you're talking sure. about making compliance automated. This is what DevOps is all about. Right, I mean, this is this is kind of where it's going. How do you how how do you expand more on that? Take a minute to explain. Sure. So, so Red Hat uh, over the last uh, twenty plus years uh, has been doing things that are now called DevOps or DevSecOps, uh, any number of com uh, combinations of, of those words. But uh, the the reality is that we've worked in in things like small teams. Uh, we've worked to make uh, things like microservices where you have a very well-defined and discrete service that can be scaled up. Uh, and then that's been incorporated into our products. But not only that, we release those things back to the open source community to make uh, the broader uh, Linux platform, for example, uh, the broader Kubernetes platform to make those things uh, stronger uh, and to also to get more visibility to some of those security uh, items so that there is a level of trust that you can have in the software supply chain that's being created, uh, not only with these, but the things that the customers are building uh, based on these, these solutions. Yeah, that's a good point. Trust and all that compliances too, but also when you have that trust, now you got a product, you want to actually deploy it or have customers consume it. Um, it hasn't always been easy, Trey, in government. You got FedRAMP. I mean, I talk to Teresa Carlson about this all the time at AWS. You know, there's all kinds of you know things you got hoops you got to jump through. How are you guys making that easier? Because again, that's another concern. You got you guys got a great channel. You got the upstream first. You got the open source. Um, you know, enterprises certainly do great, and now you're doing great in public sector. How are you guys making it easier for partners to on ramp into all these Fed programs? Yeah, so when I think about the application transformation that organizations are going through, um, we have, especially in the OpenShift environment, we have what we call the operator framework, which allows operational knowledge to be used as code. Uh, and that's going to be a, kind of a running theme for us, but uh, to be able to do these things as code, uh, whether it's uh, things like our compliance operator, uh, which allow you to do testing of a production environment uh, testing of operational elements of your uh, infrastructure to be able to test them for compliance. Is FIPS enabled? Are FIPS uh, cryptographic uh, libraries being used? And at what levels are they being used by simply the operating system? Are they being used in the Kubernetes environment? Are they even being used uh, to access AWS services? So one of the, the big things that is important for Red Hat customers that are moving into the cloud is the depth at which we can leverage the cloud provider services such as the AWS services, uh, but also bring uh, new application services uh, that the customer may be familiar with on-prem, bring those into the environment and then be able to test. So you, you trust, but you verify uh, and you provide that visibility and ultimately that accountability to the customer that is interested in using your solution in the cloud. And that's what one of the uh, success criteria is going to yeah. be. Yeah, and speed too is a big theme we're hearing. Speed, agility, I mean, agility has been talked about all the time with DevOps, DevSecOps, and you know, all these ops automation, but speed, the deployment. This brings up to the point about, we kind of teed up a little bit at the top of the interview, but there's been a big year for disruption. Pandemic, um, uncertainty, 
polarized political environment, geopolitical, you got stuff in space, congestion, contention there, you got the edge of the network exploding. So we all knew paradigm shifting going on everywhere, right? So, you know, and, and all, the, all the turmoil. Pandemic specifically has been driving a lot of change. How has all this disruption accelerated the public sector cloud journey? Because we were talking earlier, you know, the they public sector didn't have a big IT budget. Now it was never super funded like enterprises. They're not flush with cash. Um, and their motivation was to kind of go slow. Not anymore. Sure. Not anymore. So I, I think uh, a lot of organizations have drawn inspiration uh, from those factors, right? So you have these factors that say that you have a limited budget uh, and that necessity brings out the innovation, right? And the, especially for government organizations, the, uh, the, the spirit of the innovation is something that runs deep in the culture. And, and when faced with those kinds of uh, things, they, they actually uh, rise to the occasion. And so I think about things like the US Navy's Compiled to Combat 24 program, which we're a part of. And that program is leveraging things like automation, dev, sec ops, and the agile methods to create uh, new capabilities and new uh, software. Uh, and as the, the program name says, it's compiled to combat in 24 hours. So the idea is that you can have software that is created a new capability deployed and in theater uh, within a short period of time. That's very uh, agile and it's also a very innovative thing. And that's all leveraging uh, Red Hat's portfolio of, of uh, products, uh, but it's also their um, vision that and their methodology to actually bring that to life. So we're, we're very fortunate and very glad to be a part of that and continue to iterate in that, that way. Well, it's nice to be on the roadmap of, of the product requirements that are needed now than never, because the speed is super important and the role of the data and all the things that you're doing and open source drives that. Trey, great to have you on, uh, sharing your insight. What, just a personal question, hyperscale partner leader is your title. What does that mean? Yeah, it means you're working with the hyperscales, you're hyperscale, who are your partners? Just take a minute to explain what you do. It's a fascinating Yeah, uh, it, job. it definitely means that I'm hyperscale, 100%. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the other thing it means, uh, we view the cloud service providers as hyperscalers, right? They have uh, capacity on demand, pay as you go, um, this very elastic nature to what they do. They offer infrastructure uh, as a service that you can then use for the foundations of your solutions. So as a hyperscale partner, uh, leader, well, what I do is I work very closely with the uh, AWS team. Uh, I actually, super long story short, I, I came from AWS uh, after spending about three years there. So understand it pretty well. Uh, and in this particular case, I am working with them to bring the whole portfolio of Red Hat products, uh, not only onto the cloud for customers to consume in a self-directed manner, but also as we build out uh, more of these managed services across uh, application services, AI, ML, uh, as you mentioned with things like COVID, uh, there are discrete examples of things like business process management, uh, decision-making that are used in hospitals and uh, inside of uh, uh, places within the, the, the government, you know, uh, that are really wrestling with these decisions. So. I'm very pleased with uh, you know the relationship that we have with AWS. Uh, they're a great partner. It's a great opportunity to talk, uh, especially now at reInvent. Yeah. So these are all really good things. I'm really excited to be the hyperscale partner leader. Well, it's great that you have the the, uh, the DNA from AWS. You know how to do the working backwards stuff. You know the cultures, both technical cultures. So um, very customer centric. So uh, nice fit. Thank you for sharing that. And thanks for the insight into uh, reInvent and uh, Red Hat, thank you. All right, it was great to be here and look forward to learning a lot this reInvent. Great, we'll see you on the interwebs throughout this next couple of weeks. Uh, Trey Vance, Hyperscale Partner Manager, really putting in the cloud to Red Hat and customers and public sector. This is our special coverage of the public sector day here at reInvent and ongoing coverage, CUBE Virtual throughout the next couple of weeks. I'm John Furrier, your host, thanks for watching.